particular, we've been talking about the SSBX. Of course, as we're going out there to uh, St. Mary's, so this has been uh, the reason behind this. And, you know, even though the title has had to do with SSBX, uh, it's been more kind of just on Catholicism. And then in studying that, of course, in my mind, I'm realizing a lot of things that, you know, I didn't actually know. And I've been very openly saying that, hey, you got to be careful not to misrepresent what uh, their beliefs are and stuff like that. And what I'm finding is I can kind of understand why people have to go to school and take years and years and years because you can't just like open up a book and, and say exactly what Catholics teach. It's long, years and years. I mean, they claim 2,000 years of history. I don't think it goes back that far, but they, uh, you know, long story short, there's a lot of stuff out there, books and books and books and, and all these kinds of things. So what I want to talk about today is what is a heretic or a um, some words that you hear sometimes are schisms, divisions, heresies, these kinds of words are out there. I just look up the word heretic from like a, a Catholic encyclopedia kind of an idea. And uh, oh man, it's like, I just wanted a quick definition of what heresy is. And it's just like, number one, connotation and, and, and definition, and then you have distinctions, and then you have degrees of heresy, then you have the gravity of sin of heresy, the origin, speed, and persistence of the heresy, Christ, the apostles, and the fathers on heresy, vindication of their teachings, church legislation on heresy, ancient medieval present day legislation, its principles, ecclesiastical uh, jurisdiction over heretics, reception of converts, role of heresy in history, intolerance, and cruelty. And so, like, if you want to know something, I'll, I'll say this about Catholicism, like, you just have to ask somebody to show you the records and they've got it all on file, they've got everything that they're supposed to believe. Whereas if you go to like our website, we're independent Baptist, so I don't, you can't even call us Protestant because if, I mean, if you said, hey, uh, well, which sect of Protestantism are you? And I said, okay, well, if, if we were Lutheran, you would go to, uh, you know, a, a set of beliefs that Lutherans hold to. If we were Methodist or whatever, I, I suppose, Pretty much every denomination has something like that. As independent Baptists, you know what most guys, like a little bit, almost kind of stubbornly, will say, like, what's your articles of faith? And they'll go, <laughs> right there. So if you go on our website and say, what do these guys believe? Let's look at their articles of faith. Now, there are a lot of churches, independent Baptist churches, that will have this kind of long articles of faith. But if you question on a lot of people don't even have a clue that's even in there. <laughs> All right? we, we, and so our articles of faith that our church holds to whenever it was founded, uh, you know, I, I, I looked through those. I didn't see anything that I, I totally disagree with. There's a few cases where it'll make a point and then it'll give some verses. And I disagree with those verses in context to that. Like that's not actually what those verses are talking about. But I, I don't say there's anything that I couldn't hold to. I would have had a problem probably becoming the pastor of the church if that was the case. But at the end of the day, uh, as an independent Baptist, those things aren't, it's not super important to have a, a creed or a set of, a set of doctrine, in my, in my opinion. And so what I did on our website, for instance, is I kind of consolidated that and simplified those. And it's like, uh, you know, these long titles and, 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 and long definitions, I just put it in one sentence one short sentence or a couple sentences and then put a Bible, couple Bible verses with that. I like the idea of simplifying things, keeping things super simple. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, you know, studying Catholicism and what they believe is not, it's not really simple. <laughs> okay, there's a lot uh, there and, and, and that's okay. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not against that. Honestly, I keep coming to the idea where it's like, well, I don't really want to spend all my time studying what Catholics teach. I just want to study the Bible and, and uh, and preach the Bible. But there is a sense in which, and the Apostle Paul is a good example of this, he knew the, the, the crowd that he was talking to, he knew what their philosophers said. He knew what their, uh, he, you know, their, philosoph their philosophers and, and religious leaders, and he knew what they taught because he studied those things so that he could better uh, present the gospel to somebody and talk about uh, where he's coming from. Okay, but here's something that we hear thrown out a lot in religious circles is the word her heretic, okay? I don't want to be called a heretic, for sure, right? Who wants to be called a heretic? And, and maybe that means different things to different people, 
Uh, but again, I want to know what does the Bible say about that, particularly, and kind of get my, my idea from that. So that's what we're going to do. But many times if someone calls you a heretic, it's, it can be quite offensive, particularly if <clears throat> you're wanting to belong to the group that's calling you a heretic. That'd be quite offensive, right? Like, no, no, no. Let's say, uh, let's say a whole bunch of my Baptist brothers and sisters, you know, because you know Baptists have all their little sects, sects as well. And what if this group over here says, hey, you know, we, we're not going to fellowship with you. You're a heretic. And I'm like, hey, but we're both independent fundamental Baptists. What do you mean I'm a heretic? Like, I'd be offended by that, right? Or the other thing is if they, by calling you a heretic, they're claiming that you believe something that a group that you don't want to belong to beliefs. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, so they're calling you a heretic and they're saying like, hey, you believe like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. Like, we tend to think, hey, that's a cult. That's, you know, those people teach some weird things or whatever. So it would be offend you'd be offended if somebody called you that and made reference to it. There's different reasons uh, to be offended at that word. But normally uh, people are quite offended uh, if, if you were to call them a heretic. Now, interestingly enough, first thing I want to tell you as far as the definition, a biblical definition goes, is if you were to take the Greek word, which Greek, Latin, and English, all of them sound pretty much the same because it's the same word that we're talking about, for parity. But sometimes the English translation, or the translators changed it in the King James to sect, okay, uh, S-E-C-T. So... It's kind of interesting. Like, what does that have to do with heresy? You know, do they mistranslate or whatever? Of course, I don't. I don't believe that. Uh, but why did they change that? And here's the reason why they changed that. Because it means the same thing. It means the same thing. But the context behind what we're, you're talking about might change a little, a little bit of how you would say it. And so the the uh, King James translators use that according to our understanding, our language, in splitting up those uses of the words. Okay. So let me show you a couple places where. It's a, the same word, and I'm not big on going back to the Greek, but, like I said, this is the origin of the word, and it means the same thing in Latin, it means the same thing in English. Uh, but it's good to see how it's used in the Bible. So go to the book of Acts. All these will be from the book of Acts. And look at Acts 5. Verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Now, interestingly enough, that word sect there is the same as, as heresy or heretic. So, in essence, it's, it, you know, it'd be, we would think of it weird with our understanding of the word heretic. We would think of it weird to say, with the heretics of the Sadducees, right? It would kind of takes on a different, a different flavor whenever you read that. You read it that way, uh, okay? But he's just talking about a group of people who believed this way, which was contrary to, uh, you know, the group that is calling them heretics. Basically, they're calling them a sect. Okay, uh, the Pharisees were also called a sect. Look at Acts chapter fifteen. Acts 15, verse 5. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. You can go to Galatians and, and all and see uh, where that kind of a thinking comes from. But this group of people here from the Pharisees are being referred to as a sect. Look at Acts 24. Verse 5, for we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Anybody want to know who they're talking about? That's actually kind of a title that was given to Christians at that point. This, this, this strange sect over here of the Nazarenes. Well, Jesus was the Nazarene, right? Jesus the Nazarene. 
because he was from Nazareth, he wasn't a Nazarite, okay, but uh, some people get that mixed up. And so the Christians were identified by that, and they were called this, this uh, sect of the Nazar Nazarenes. Look at Acts 28. Before they were called Christians, they were called all kinds of things. But. Acts chapter 28, verse 22. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And again, that's talking about Christianity and this kind of new teaching uh, that's involved there. Now, the word her heretic or heresy, you know, whatever that root word is, it, come, it literally means, and this is a little bit surprising too, but it means able to choose. Doesn't that seem weird? Like, my, I would think that heresy would just have something to do with, like, breaking a teaching or teaching something falsely or whatever. It means able to choose. So the only logical thing that I can think of there, and, and it's kind of un, unknown where that origin was exactly, but the only thing I can think of is able to choose choose what? Well, you're able to choose what you believe. You're able to choose, like, I want to break away from this group and believe what this other group believes or something like that. And so going to that would make you a heretic because you're leaving this group and you're going to that group. So a lot of these words are talking about the same things. Um, there are times where there are schisms and of course the the bible says let there not be any schisms among you what is that first corinthians 12 says that there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another now interestingly enough when i read about the church and i read in the bible it's always talking about local bodies right local assemblies of believers and so when it's saying there shouldn't be any isms in the church it's saying like hey when you guys meet together and i'll show you this here in a minute when you guys meet together like be on the same page right you should all agree together and uh and so you know to say everybody in the world who claims to be a christian needs to all be it's impossible like that could never happen and again i'm gonna show you some verse here in a second that kind of backs that up but in a body, in a local body, we can be without schism, right? We can be without division, and we can be on the same page, and there could be nobody in here who's preaching what we would call a heresy. But when you talk about a huge body, like all throughout the earth kind of a body, how in the world could you do that? Well, the only way you could do that is to have leaders appointed over this, you know, basically coming like this whole, it's almost like a, Communism over the planet, over the whole earth. Like you got, like we're gonna watch everything that you're doing, and we're gonna have uh, bishops over this, and archbishops here, and bishops over there, and cardinals here, and I don't even know uh, how those are all used. Uh, that would take a lot of work. And if our church ran like you know 5,000 people, which I don't ever see it happening that way, to be honest with you, uh, I see after, especially think about how far everybody's coming from. You get to where you got like 100 people or something it's like hey a lot of guys are coming over from this area over there so let's just start having a group meet over there like that's my philosophy on it uh but let's say if something happened we didn't have that that wasn't a possibility so we had like 5,000 people i guarantee that the sh we'd have to be more structured we have to be more organized and there have to be some kind of a way to vet people and make sure they're not teaching some kind of false things and and all that and that's just the nature of it like, can you imagine like worldwide trying to stick with something that by the way they were trying to say you know hundreds of years ago thousands of years ago and really it's impossible like it doesn't it really doesn't doesn't work you have to really force that and make that fit to say that you're sticking with this uh belief system with no <clears throat> no divisions so when it comes to catholicism there have been lots of schisms okay there has been the schism of what is it 1040 uh, 1054 or something like that uh you know where the orthodox uh, splits and stuff like that and and uh, again i don't know the history of it very well i, I haven't probably done the study that i should or that I, that I care to do uh but there's been these different divisions and of course now there's there's greek orthodox and russian orthodox and uh eastern catholicism and roman catholicism and i don't understand all the little splits and all but uh but they're called schisms and in some cases uh, there have been those who have been labeled heretics. Um, obviously, uh, in the Reformation, they declared um, uh, Luther, almost said Lucifer, 
from the Lord. I can't remember. <laughs> but Luther as a heretic, and uh, and so they didn't want anything to do with him. And of course, that was a huge deal because he was still claiming to be Catholic. He was just like, hey, I don't agree with some of the things that they're doing. And he had this famous quote that said, like, I didn't leave Catholicism. Catholicism left me. And uh, and so to call him a heretic was a was a pretty big deal. And that's kind of where the Reformation started after that. So he chose, you know, this, I mean, anybody who, 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 would, who would divide and be schismatic, they would be willfully choosing to go this, this route. Now, I'm not actually going to spend a lot of time on the SSPX, but there is a huge debate in Catholicism as to whether or not they're schismatic, meaning are, have they totally separated from the church? Most would say yes, because of the fact that uh, they weren't recognized by the Pope, and that what they did uh, in uh, Lefe, uh, Marcel Lefebvre, you know, he ordained certain archbishops or whatever it was, I can't remember uh, the right names, but he, he put these people in order without the authority of the Pope, so therefore it wasn't recognized, and so therefore people said, hey, he's doing stuff outside of the uh, authority of the church, and so they're schismatic. And then others say, well, they're not schismatic because later another pope said, okay, you can take mass there, and you can uh, take, confess your sins there, and all that. And so, uh, so there's a big debate now saying, well, why would he say that you could do that if he thought that we were schismatic? And so there's, there's, there's all this kind of stuff. So all I'm saying, though, is that these names do get thrown up there. And so how does it apply to us? Well, I don't like being called a heretic, for sure. But I want to know what that means. And so I did a study on the Bible. We talked about this in Sunday school in, in uh, Iola. And I looked at the places where heres, heresy is used. And, you know, on the surface, the fact that I would say, you know what, I don't agree with this church that I grew up with or something like that. And so I have a slightly different view on this. And so I choose to believe this over what they teach. On the surface, most of us probably say, that's not really that big of a Okay, but it is a big deal depending on the social uh, severity of that choice. You know what I mean? So if I were to say, <clears throat> you know, I'm going to go over here and be part of this, and then all of a sudden, again, I'm, I'm told that I'm part of some strange cult, or I'm told that I'm preaching damnable heresy, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Now, I want to tell you this. I've had independent Baptists say, what I'm doing over here is damnable heresy and the way that we preach the gospel the way we, we win souls is making people too full of the child of hell and i'm gonna tell you that was offensive to me they call me a heretic i'm a back i'm an independent fundamental baptist why am i a heretic because i don't do something the exact way that you do well let me tell you this when it comes to something that is called a damnable heresy isn't that a big deal isn't that a lot bigger of a deal more grave uh uh accusation than somebody who just has a slight little uh, you know differences of opinion so the reality is you know there are things that are essential doctrines and then there are things that aren't really that that big of doctrines so what does the Bible say what's important to us what do we want to make sure uh, that we're not called so here are some biblical uh, ways that it, that it was used look at first Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11. <clears throat> so this is somewhat of a definition I'm going to give here, but a heretic is someone who adopts a belief system that isn't approved, okay, isn't approved by whom? By the person that's calling them a heretic. It just depends, mm -hmm. okay? So if I call you a heretic, that means that you have adopted a certain belief system that isn't approved by the group that I identify, okay? or our church or whatever. Now again, doctrine is important. There's kind of two extremes. You can get to where, hey, you gotta believe exactly like we do, and it kind of start looking like a cult, you know? Uh, that could go to one extreme. And then the other extreme is, you know what, we want peace among ourselves, and we never want any fighting, we never want anybody to argue or disagree with each other, so we're just not gonna deal with the doctrine. A lot of churches have gone that direction. Okay? There's a lot of churches that have become Kind of social clubs and you just go there for you know companionship and friends maybe sing some songs uh, which a lot of contemporary songs stay away from any doctrinal issues issues or anything and so uh so you know you can go there and not worry about you know somebody dealing with that 
and all these different churches can be called whatever. You know, it doesn't matter, Methodist church or non-denominational church or whatever, but you go there, and if it's that type of church that, hey, we just don't talk about doctrine here, then, you know, you can just fit right in. Um, I think it was Brother Justin, uh, I don't know who his soul winning partner was, but he was talking to somebody, and uh, he was, they were, I believe, Methodists, United Methodists, I'm guessing, anybody want? Okay, I knew somebody would remember what story I'm about to tell, but, and, uh, and somehow they started talking about the issue of homosexuality, which if you don't know, the Methodists have a huge division as to whether or not, uh, I mean, to the extent where they're ordaining homosexuals. And so, uh, so there's a big, you know, division among them. And so somehow it came up and Brother Justin was actually trying to avoid the conversation, but then he kind of like point blank asked him and he said, uh, I got into a discussion and basically what I'm getting at is this guy said this, he said, well, because Justin said, well, the Bible says, and he started taking the Bible and the guy said, well, we don't really hold strictly to the Bible. <laughs> And I'm like, this is a, I don't know if he was a preacher or what, but this is a guy that's like defending his church, defending his thing. And they're like, you know, well, at our church, we don't really strictly hold to the Bible. That's a big deal, okay? You want to, doctrine is important. Don't get me wrong. But look at 1 Corinthians 11. Let me show you the, uh, you know, this kind of shows both things. It shows why it's a good thing, and then it kind of makes you understand why, it, you know, there's kind of both sides of this. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 11, when we do the Lord's Supper, a lot of times we'll go to this passage. I think every time we go to this passage. But in verse 19, Paul is talking to this church here, and he says, or actually start verse 18. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you. See how that's kind of associated with that word divisions? Uh, there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Okay, now here's, that's a little bit confusing the way that it's said, but here's what I, I believe he's, he's saying in the context too, because he's saying like when you come together, you know, there shouldn't be these divisions, especially when you come together, together to take the Lord's Supper. Uh, again, you're, I'm going to have to preach that another message, how to define the Lord's Supper, but when you come together, there shouldn't be divisions. You're united together as a body. You're united to, uh, to, to take the Lord's Supper, right? You're commemorating his death, burial, resurrection, and, or his, his, and I guess in that, you're taking his death on the cross, and uh, you're, you're, you're remembering that. Okay, this do in remembrance of me, he says. And so he says, when you come together, you know, there must be heresies uh, that, which, uh, 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 that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Okay, so what is he saying? I want to know if people in this congregation or any visitors that come in or whatever, I want to know where they disagree with us. I want to know where we agree and where we disagree. And for them to come in and be like, you know, no, I'm too afraid to talk about what I believe because I might get kicked out of here or something like that. Like, no, we don't want anybody to do that. We want to know where we agree and where we disagree. But here's the thing. There are some issues that if somebody came in here and they just refused to agree with us, at some point, we would we would try to teach them and preach them and say, this is why we believe what we believe. At some point, it's like, if you don't believe, if you don't fellowship with us, if you don't believe just like us, what well, Amos 3, 3 say, like, go, who can walk together unless they be agreed? Uh, you know, if then there's probably another church for you out there or something, because we want people that are going to be on the same page, and we're working together, and, and we can sit down and fellowship, and, and there's going to be slight disagreements, slight disputes, and I don't see it that way, and I don't see that. There's that's just normal. But on big major things where it's like, hey, we can't fellowship with those people because they're teaching this doctrine that's just unreasonable. There shouldn't be in one church like all these different divisions. Like that's those are main things. We need to be in agreement on that. And on the lesser things, we can still fellowship and be one body with slight disagreements. They're non essential non essential doctrines. Okay? So uh the problem is, again, many doctrines that are not essential to the faith, you know, people are making those as if those are main things. And, and they say, well, if you don't agree with that, then you're a heretic. And I'm not supposed to fellowship with heretics. And so, therefore, we can't fellowship. And we're talking about matters such as, do Christians go through three and a half years of tribulation? <laughs> you know? Or does the rapture come at any moment? And... 
we don't see any tribulation. And we can have argues, arguments about that. We can have debates about that. I enjoy talking about that. But the problem is, for some reason, among independent Baptists, like when you start talking about that, there's just like, oh, you're on that side and I'm on this side. We can't walk together because we're not agreed. Well, if it was a damnable heresy that I was preaching, I'd understand that. <laughs> but if we're talking about a slight different interpretation of Matthew 24 and Revelation 8, you know, and we can both prove our points, well, at least I can prove my point, but anyway, <laughs> I'm just teasing, uh, then we should be able to sit down and say, it's no big deal, guess what, both going to heaven, both going to be in the rapture, both going to, you know, be go, pl claim our salvation for the same reason, you know, that's not a big deal, we can sit down and we can still fellowship, but some people don't, don't see it that way, I think it has to do with being a little bit confused on who's a heretic and, and, and what does that mean exactly whenever you call somebody that. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5. And this kind of speaks of that other extreme. All right, Galatians 5, look at verse 20. There is a type of heresy that's a flat-out sin, and it, it's harmful for the people, and it's harmful for the cause of Christ, and God considers it a sin. Look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Verse 20 says, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness. So right in the middle of all that, he's talking about heresies, okay? So there does come this point, and what does that look like? Well, I believe that would look like, number one, I mean, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but preaching the false gospel or something like that, but not just that, but going in and trying to cause division. Maybe somebody doesn't even care. They don't even have a, really believe anything, but they're just like trying to split people up and trying to cause division and and uh, posting stuff online and trying to split people and say, hey, these guys are this and, and that. And it's like instead of actually trying to sit down and harmonize this or be like, hey, how big of a difference is it? How essential is this doctrine? They're like trying to cause these schisms and stuff like that. That's a sin. Okay, that's a work of the flesh. That's not a work of the spirit. The spirit's going to try to bring unity. And so, uh, so that's, you know, the, the heretic, number one, is someone who adopts a belief system that isn't uh, approved of whatever group is calling them a heretic. Okay, number two, a heretic is someone we need to be watching for. Okay, the Bible makes it clear that we should be watching for the fact that we know with a surety that there's going to be people that come into our congregation who teach what the Bible calls damnable heresies. Look at 2 Peter 2 1. And again, and you know, I've had people who should be my Christian brothers and sisters uh, make reference to me being a damnable heretic. And I'm like, either you don't know what that means, or you're accusing me of something, or, or you're the damnable heretic. Because if you think I'm preaching the wrong salvation, then I'm wondering what, what I'm in mean, the wrong gospel. I'm wondering what kind of gospel you're preaching. All right. So look at 2 Peter 2 1 says, <clears throat> uh, let's see, chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately bring, uh, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. If you think about what was being preached in those days, and what the context here, and I'll show you in John, or actually uh, Brother, Jeff, uh, Brother Austin already read that, but uh, we'll go back there in a minute what's going on in the church and what these people are saying you know what is the what are they denying it says denying the uh, lord that bought them okay so obviously any christian should agree that the lord paid our bride the price for our sins his death burial resurrection that's the gospel first corinthians 15. everybody should be in agreement with that okay so if somebody's rejecting that the lord He's rejecting Christ who's bought them, what does that mean? They're rejecting that his payment on the cross 
uh, in the whole gospel message, death, burial, resurrection, I want to put them all together, uh, that that's not sufficient, that that didn't actually pay for our sins, right? Because they're denying that he bought them. And so they're adding to that and saying, no, I don't understand he did that, but it didn't actually pay the price. I still have to do this and I still have to do that. I would consider that to be a damnable heresy because they're saying you have to add to what the Lord did in order to in order to be saved. And so it's not like people were saying, like, well, we don't believe that there was a man named Jesus Christ. No, it's just they're teaching things about Jesus Christ that weren't true. And particularly, you know, that that he came and he was the gift of God and he uh, provided himself a sacrifice. And so we need to know that there are going to be people that creep in and teach something different than that. And so it says there that we uh, are to be uh, aware of that and cautious of that. Look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 10. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Okay, but again, are we talking about somebody who just slightly has a different teaching, a different a difference of opinion with you? No, I don't believe that at all. What it is is somebody who's teaching something that's like a damnable heresy. The first thing we need to do is sit down and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What you're teaching is this, but what the Bible says is this, and this is how people are saved, right? They reject that, or, you know, I mean, there are other major doctrines, Trinity and stuff like that, you know, that, 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 that might be worth, you know, getting to this heated argument about and saying, look, if you deny that, if you reject that, you know, I'm going to give you a chance to correct that and change your mind on that, but if not, we can't walk together. You're going to have to go a different direction because uh, we're not on the same page. So he says, after the first... And second, admonition, right? So you try again. You say, well, I don't think you're getting it. You know, maybe even, hey, this is the last time and we're going we're gonna to decide this, you know, uh, come to this conclusion, and then we're going to part ways. Okay, after the first, second, admonition, reject. Look at second John, where we started. Second John. Chapter 1, verse 10. You know what, let's start in, let's start in verse 9 for some context here. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So why is it so important that we don't team up with somebody who's preaching a false doctrine, I mean a false gospel, who's preaching a damnable heresy? Because we don't want to make it seem like we're okay with what they're teaching. Okay, so, and I use this analogy this morning in a Sunday school, but again, let's say a Jehovah's Witness, I'm familiar with a lot of what they teach. And let's say they come and they come into my house and I'm like, hey, you know what? Come on in, sit down, let's have a little conversation and, and I get along, which I, you know, if I'm going and knocking on their door and I find out some of the Jehovah's Witness, I'm super hospitable and I talk to them and we, we have a discussion and stuff like that because I just knock on their door, right? It's a little bit different. But in this case, somebody's in my neighborhood and they're knocking on doors and I know what they're teaching, I know what they're preaching and they come to my door and I bring them in and then I send them on their way, and then I'm like, hey, 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 you need a water? You need a water? And I give them the water. And then I say, hey, God be with you. God bless you. Godspeed. Right? Everybody else in my neighborhood just saw that. And what they're saying, is, what, what they're thinking now is like, hey, I guess he doesn't have a problem with them. He might agree. Hey, he had them in their house. Maybe I can have them in my house. And I don't know if my other neighbors who are lost are now going to be taught this, this damnable heresy, and gonna, it's going to keep them from getting saved because they're going to be believing a lie. And I just had part in that. And so it should be a big deal. In fact, what I really think about whenever I see someone knocking doors in my neighborhood is I just want to get, get my Bible and uh, just kind of start following that person around. And like after they leave the door, just go to that door and say, 
hey, I don't know what that guy just told you, but let me show you what the Bible says about how you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, right? Because I don't want to be part and them thinking that I believe what this person is teaching, right? When it comes to the, the title Christian, for instance, oh, well, we're all Christians. Yeah, but we, we're not on the same page. I respect, uh, another, again, using Brother Justin as an example, but I know something that he started saying a lot when he goes soul winning is, hey, well, before I leave, I, I just want to make it very clear that I don't believe what you're saying because a lot of people want want to leave friendly, which is good. I'm not saying go be a jerk and try to make fights, get fights or something like that, but they want to leave friendly. So they're like, yeah, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, we're on the same page. And he's like, if I'm preaching the gospel and this person thinks you got to work to keep your salvation, he's like, I don't want that person thinking that I'm teaching that. So he, he'll often leave them by saying, I, I just don't want to leave here with you thinking that we believe the same thing because I don't believe what you just said. And I can talk to you and explain to you why you know, but I don't want you to think that we believe the same thing. And I respect that. Like, some people might be like, oh, that's kind of like confrontational or, or whatever. But look, you're going to preach the gospel. You're going to preach the truth. They've got to know first what's wrong so that they can understand uh, the correction to, the, to that and they can know the truth. Okay, so it's very cl clear that we're supposed to be rejecting heretics. After the first, second admonition, reject. Now, again, depending on how someone's going to define heresy, you know, I, I don't think it's a big deal just if somebody believes something different than you do, or they stand a little different there, you know, maybe the church plays a different kind of music or dresses a little different than you do. That's totally different. Totally different. We're talking about major issues of, of division, like doctrinal salvation type issues, okay? Uh, we do certainly don't want to um, give the impression that we believe the same thing. Now, let me tell you what I got uh, I got a little message on my way up here. Uh, I know I'm not supposed to be looking at my phone while I'm driving, but I, I did. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I got a message. Somebody left a message on the website and said, hey, I wanna, I'm want i trying to talk to whoever is in charge of the soul winning event in, uh, in uh, St. Mary's. And I they proceeded to say that he is inviting us, anybody who wants to come, to a barbecue at his house. He's been a teacher at one of the universities there for like 15 years. And he said, you know, I just live right down. He doesn't live in St. Mary's, but he lives just a little bit down the way. And he's like, you know, I think that a lot of these guys are grow up in this community and they're sheltered and they don't know what other people teach. He says, I think it'll be, it would be beneficial for them to hear what you guys have to say and, and kind of see like a different point of view uh, out there. Now, obviously, there's indicators that I'm just kind of like, I need to know more about this before I just jump into it or whatever, but uh, I'm going to talk to him tomorrow. I texted him back and, and said I'm going to talk to him more about this opportunity and what he's thinking. And uh, and probably what we do is after we go so and so our soul one will just be warm-up time. <laughs> and we'll sit down and, and talk a little more close and personal. I think it's a great opportunity. But here's where, where I'm going with that. If I found out that people were coming into our neighborhood who were preaching false doctrine, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you know, I'd be saying, hey, you know, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says, and if you disagree with that, we're going to part ways. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. This is different. This is like, hey, well, if you want to do that, I'm willing to come and tell you what we believe. You know what I mean? But I'm certainly not teaming up and like bidding you Godspeed and all that kind of stuff. And so. Well, I have a lot to pray about this, and, and, I'll, and I'd ask you to pray about it as well. Uh, I just thought that was kind of interesting, considering the fact that if they believe we're heretics. Now, again, you have to go into the definition, the Catholic definition of heretics. There are some people, they don't believe, uh, they believe they're heretics, but it's not severe because of the fact that it's kind of ignorant. They just don't, they don't know. If that was the case, it's kind of like, well, why don't you just let everybody be ignorant, and then nobody's going to get in trouble, <laughs> right? That's kind of a silly, kind of a silly thing, but uh, but that's what they believe. Like some people are they're heretics, but they don't know any better. It's kind of like they say that you have to be baptized in the Catholic Church to be saved. But there is the baptism of desire, which means that you know you would get baptized if you knew better. And so and it's just God knows the heart kind of a thing. Look, the Bible's very clear on things, and we need to stand where we know the Bible's clear, and we need to reject things that go against those biblical teachings. And so. Uh, uh, so, so I'm not going to 
You know, if someone's preaching a false gospel, I'm going I'm to tell them what the Bible says and give them a chance to receive that. If they don't receive that, all right, have a nice day. Right? So, uh, so we'll see. I'll pray about that, and I'll think, and I want to talk to them on Monday and see, uh, you know, how we what what the what the idea is and what the invitation is exactly. Maybe we'll eat barbecue first and then have a discussion. That way, if we have to leave, it's like we already ate. <laughs> all right. Finally, this is a real quick point. Number three, a heretic is something that people will call us for following the truth. Okay? Right. Someone disagrees with us, they're still going to call us a heretic. And so don't get offended. Don't get bent out of shape if people are calling you a heretic necessarily. Uh, again, there are times where in the flesh we're obviously going to be offended by it. But, hey, it doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. You don't have to be like, no, I'm not a heretic. What can I say to get this person not to call me a heretic? As long as you're right before God, you know, uh, if, if being right is going to separate you from a group of people who believe something different when it comes to an essential truth, so be it. Divide up and go your separate ways, right? Because you want to be right before God and, and, and know that you're teaching right according to him. Who cares what, what man thinks? Okay, so look at Acts chapter 24. Acts 24, verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Okay, and as we can add to that now that we have the New Testament that we can add to the works of the apostles. Okay, uh, We uh, are called heretic by those people, but we still continue to worship the God of our fathers and believe in uh, Jesus Christ and his uh, the salvation that he offers, the gift of God of eternal life through what he did on the cross and not by our works and not by any other means, uh, but by what he did. Anyway, I hope that helps you understand that those words a little bit more about schisms and heresies and, and divisions. Again, not everyone's going to define it that way, but we want to know what, what the Bible says when it talks about these words. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, for your church. I pray you help us uh, as a local body to, uh, to be on the same page and to be in unity. And anybody that would come teaching uh, something different when it comes to essential doctrines, Lord, help us to be... Uh, merciful in giving them uh, an opportunity to receive that and uh, and of course charitable in the way that we deal with them but then help us also to recognize that some people just won't be a part of this work and they won't uh, see things the way that you see them and believe them and I pray Lord that you will help us to be uh, honest as we search the scriptures and not misrepresent people or uh, or claim to believe something that we've not actually studied ourselves or, or any of those things, Lord. I pray you help us be honest and search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Uh, but I pray that you would help us walk in agreement and walk in uh, uh, without schisms among ourselves, uh, that you would be glorified in the work that we do here. And I pray this in Jesus' name.